Well, the space program, the manned space program, had always been about using the biggest possible technology to get to the moon as fast as possible. It was about looking onwards and outwards and upwards to space and to the future. But there'd actually been a pause in the space program in 1968 after an Apollo fire disaster. So that before Apollo 8, there'd only been one manned mission that had just gone round and round the Earth for nearly two weeks, getting people bored. So Apollo 8, that actually went very boldly all the way to the moon, was a real departure. It was a departure in a very bad year for the United States as well. The Vietnam War and the atrocities when the bombings were on the TV screens almost every day of the year, and it was getting worse by December. Um, uh, Bobby Kennedy being shot in the presidential campaign, Nixon had been elected, there was student unrest. 1968 was a very bad, depressing year, and Apollo 8, which went round the moon, came right at the end of that. Um, and then finally, of course, they went at Christmas. In fact, it was Christmas Eve in the United States when the Apollo astronauts were circling the moon and they chose to broadcast not anything about the future or science, but they chose to broadcast the opening of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So at Christmas time, they broadcast a peaceful, universal message from the moon, looking back home, which was not at all what the space program had been about up to that point. Well, all the illustrations of, uh, of spacecraft circling the Earth show that, that people were expecting to see the whole world um, just from a great height. All the atlases at the time all had the countries and the borders and so forth. We didn't have the kind of photographic natural atlases of the world that we have now. So when we actually got a picture of the Earth, and not only were there no borders, but you could barely see individual countries, it was much more like a natural object. That was a tremendous surprise to people. And the first astronauts who circled the Earth, and even more those who went very far away from it, like Apollo 8, always remarked that you look down and you can't see any of these borders borders, these human divisions, you can just see one planet. It was enormously important for Homo sapiens to get outside its own home planet and to look back and see what it looked like. It's important in the life of an individual to get that sort of revelation, so it's bound to be important in the life of a whole species. And what people saw through the eyes and the cameras of the astronauts was not a world, not a collection of countries, but almost a single living entity. You could see the Earth was there, it was simple, it was whole. It was dominated by natural features, um, by clouds and by water, not even land landscape. And it was visible as the whole Earth. And that phrase, the whole Earth, was just coming into use. And suddenly people could see that the Earth really was whole, but nothing but a virtual infinity of vacuum around it. And as soon as the Earth became visible, it acquired friends in the shape of Friends of the Earth, um, the environmental campaign organisation, which was founded by, coincidentally at the beginning of 1969. And the phrase, the whole Earth, and the understanding that the Earth was almost a single entity in which human life was only a part. We were not going to dominate the Earth, we were not going to subdue the Earth, to pave it over, um, to, 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 to defeat it with technology and the rhetoric of the time. Humanity was part of the living systems and part of the overall Earth, and there was no way that we were ever going to escape that. That in awareness was enormously important for the environmental movement. Well, the first impact that the, the, the site of Earth had was on the astronauts themselves, Bill Anders, who went around the moon on Apollo 8, um, summed it up, he said, it's incredible, we came here all the way to the moon, yet the most important thing we saw was our own home planet, the Earth. Now there wasn't an immediate impact on, on the space program, which has a thing with a very long lead time, but in the late 70s and the late 1980s, there was a program of Landsats, of Earth observation satellites, which came to seem increasingly important as they started picking up long-term environmental changes in the Earth that soon led to awareness of, of, of climate change and global warming and the fact that humanity can actually alter the Earth. People saw also what the astronauts could see, which is that seen from space, 
if you look from Earth, the, sky, the blue sky appears to go on forever like a great ocean. But in fact, if you're in orbit, you can see that the skin of the Earth, the atmosphere, is, is no thicker than the skin of an apple, relatively speaking. In a few minutes, you're up through it, you can look down on it. And it's obvious that the atmosphere, like any sea or river, can be polluted, can be changed by human action. In the 1990s, NASA changed its mission and came up with the idea of a mission to planet Earth. The, it, 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 the space program now had the Earth at its absolute centre. And of course, these days, we have massive numbers of Earth observation satellites. And the whole Earth is under 24-hour observation from satellites uh, which are in stationary orbit. So we can all look down on the Earth and see things the whole time. Well, some of the most far-sighted scientists and thinkers of the 1960s and 70s were profoundly influenced by the sight of the Earth. They understood that Earth looked like a living thing. Cell biologists um, uh, thought about this. And also, in particular, James Lovelock um, came up with the idea of the Gaia hypothesis in the 1960s, the idea that the Earth is a kind of self-regulating set of systems or even an organism which keeps the state of, of, of the atmosphere and the climate and the temperature and so on fit for human life. And he gave this idea of Earth a, a, as a self-regulating system, the name of Gaia. And the idea now, although not, not many people perhaps have, have, have heard of the Gaia hypothesis as such, we all understand that the Earth is an extremely complex set of interacting systems and that humanity is radically changing the balance of those in a relatively short lifetime. So we now all have, thanks to the picture of Earth, this picture to think with, we now all have that kind of understanding of the, of the whole Earth as a set of interlocking living systems that people like James Lovelock had in the 1960s and 70s. We all know that Earth is a planet, we all know that we are disturbing its balance and we all know that we need to do something to bring things back uh, into balance.